you very much indeed. And I think for me, just like um, for you and Dan Mobala, it's really about um, the excitement for me is about the questions um, that are likely to come at the end of the day. So I'm supposed to be talking about um, navigating life despite hurdles. So I'll put a little bit of context to it. But I think in most things, it's about our experiences. Um, and I think that's what um, Ibuku wants us to share here. Um, so first things first, and, and some of them will be basic stuff. You know, life, life is a journey. Um, and in any journey, um, there are sort of milestones, um, there are pit stops, there are hurdles, um, there are successes that we celebrate. Um, but I think what is important is that um, is, is not whether these hurdles will come or the setbacks, uh, but our state of mind and how we react and how we deal uh, with them. Um, many of the challenges in life um, are, are those that we often can't anticipate or we, don't, we, we know they may happen, but we don't know when um, they will happen. But our approach is what determines whether we succeed or whether we fail, whether we deal with it or quit uh, with it. And for me, I'm just going to talk about um, one particular situation uh, in, in, in my life that for many people um, appeared to be uh, you know, a, a major challenge. But for me, I looked at it as a hurdle. And the reason why I looked at it as a, as a hurdle is that it's called a hurdle because you have to get over it. Um, hurdlers in, in athletics, no one can see the 10 or 20 hurdles before them when they start the race. But they have to psych themselves up think about their technique, think about speed, and know that they can scale these hurdles. And that one for me was um, trying to have children after I got married. Um, for many people, it's a situation that um, you know, can affect them in very many ways, emotionally, um, relationally, uh, even with their careers, and so on. And there are different approaches, and I will share maybe five or six ways in which I approached um, that particular hurdle at that time um, of my life um, and how I just got on uh, with life despite um, the hurdles. So uh, the first one is accepting that there's a challenge and not being in denial of it. Because I think for many of us, the, the, the initial stage is one of denial. Uh, particularly with the, with the particular situation I'm talking about. There are societal pressures, there are family pressures, they're just you know, one's own personal stigma. Um, but for me, from day one, um, of course, the expectation was there. You know, you're looking at it three months, six months, one year, two years, uh, and, and nothing seems to be happening. Um, but then it was a situation that I accepted as a challenge. I accepted as a period, and a period because I knew that it would come to an end, and come to an end either with children or without children, where there would be an acceptance of the fact that this situation um, is here to stay. So it's, it's important that um, we, we don't sort of you know, brush things under the carpet and wish it away. And even in our lives, there are, there are times when you, know, you don't get that promotion and you think, oh, well, I didn't get a promotion, I'm just going to get on. No, if you don't sit down and think about why you didn't get it or why you didn't get the contract or why you didn't get the job, um, then basically you're starting a life of tripping over the first hurdle. And oftentimes it's difficult to pick oneself up um, after that. And the second one is about attempting to understand why. Because it's also important that if one is in a situation where there's a challenge, and one already, for me, I actually saw what success looked like. I saw the twins in my, in my hands. Um, I saw a successful career ahead of me. I saw all the things that we sometimes as women describe as, can women have it all? I saw all those things. And so I wasn't going to let one particular aspect of what I wanted for myself hold me back. If anything, it actually energized me. It sort of nourished my soul. And I'll share a little bit about that in the few minutes um, that I have. So attempting to understand, and I use the word attempt because some, many times God doesn't give us the luxury of explaining anything to us. He doesn't even owe us any explanation. But what we do know, and I'm speaking from my own faith now, is that he's not going to put us through more than he has equipped us for. And I believed, even looking at certain aspects of um, my career, some of the hurdles I had had in the past, how I suddenly just realized that the equipment for success was there around me. But it was for me to pick it up, run with it, and use it. So the usual tests that most of us women do, you know, we make sure there's nothing wrong with you and so on. And, you know, thanking God that in my own case, it was 
more or less an unexplained situation. So it wasn't something that I could do anything about. It was something I could influence, particularly by my state of mind and not getting worried. But there wasn't much that I could do about it. Um, so it's important, I think, in, 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 in this situation um, to trust that journey. So at that point, it was that, okay, fine. So this is the journey we're on. What do I spend my time doing? And I'm glad that Mobala spoke very much about time. When we talk about you know, time management, I think it's about self-management because you will never have more than 24 hours in a day. It's always 24 hours. It's how you manage that time. So the third thing is reaching out to others. I think many times when we you know, have problems, we come across challenges, we internalize as opposed to externalizing. Of course, you have to internalize so you reflect, you know what, what's going on, but it's also important to reach out to people who've been along the journey before, people who are going through their own challenges. How did they cope? How, what sort of support structures are around one? One thing that I was very clear about was that I didn't want any pity party, and so I totally deleted any detractors. I deleted anybody who was going to you know, depress my spirit, depress my soul. Of course, I would have my own quiet moments, but I avoided anybody who made it the first, you know, question they were going to ask. Um, and, and I was very clear about that because I knew where I was going. Um, one of the other things I did was do my own research. So read books, find out what's happening, what did I need to do, you know, to keep myself, um, you know, emotionally balanced and, and, and stable. The fourth thing was preparation, because I believe that if you're going on a journey, you've got to be prepared. I knew where I was going, and I think I knew what success looked like. So how was I going to prepare? I felt maybe at that time, I actually was not ready for what it was that I wanted myself. And so how was I going to spend my time on this journey? And thinking about it now, it was a major push forward for me. Instead of the situation being a setback, it was that I was going to push myself forward because of the conviction that I had. And some of the things that I did was maxing out on my work. I mean, I was totally committed to my work. I was a hard worker, a smart worker. I got the promotions. I got everything so that I would not be found wanting in my career. I didn't want to give up the career, sit at home twiddling my thumbs because I, was, I, I wanted children, and then at the end of the day, find out at 40 or 50 that I had achieved not a whole lot. So my career, my relationships with people, I saved, I invested, I acquired knowledge, I traveled, as part of that period, I actually went to live abroad for two and a half years working, which again was taboo. Oh, they are looking after, they are looking for children. Yeah, they are, but they leave their husband here. They go abroad. The usual things that many of us, you know, would say about someone. But you know what? If I hadn't done it then, I'm not sure that I would have done it when my children actually came. One thing was clear to me. I didn't know how long it was going to take, but I knew that it would cost me something. It would take me doing certain things. But at the end of the day, I knew where committing my time to those around me, to my aspirations, was going to take me to. And also, not having children didn't diminish me. So not getting that job or getting that promotion does not diminish you. The first thing is you have to look at yourself as being whole, entire, and complete. Everything else is an added bonus. So for my children to have come was an added bonus, but it did not diminish me as a person. It didn't lower my self-esteem. It didn't make me feel small because other people were. After all, I didn't want children for children's sake. I didn't want a child who may have been you know, challenged in any way. That was not the desire I had for myself, and it wasn't really the dream that I believe God had given me. But what was important was that I grew better in my choices. I grew better in my choices. I increased my capacity to do a whole lot more. And that preparation meant that when my children actually came, by that time I was already a CEO, so my time was my own. I could, you know, I, 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 could, I could flex a little bit in terms of how I manage my time. Um, I grew in competence, even in my work. So whilst you're waiting for one thing, instead of it diminishing you, find other things that will actually enhance you. Find other ways in which you can give, instead of sucking life out of other people by your misery, your woe, I didn't get this contract, I didn't get this, I don't have money, and so on and so forth. It's important that we use these setbacks as a springboard. If a person is building a house, what's the first thing they do? You dig the foundation, sometimes you go down. If you're on a trampoline, if you don't bend your knees, you can't be propelled upwards. So let's sometimes look at these setbacks as a preparation, a, a taking off from the runway. The other thing that I discovered during that period was certain innate gifts that I didn't even know that I had. 
Charity and generosity. I've always been a generous person, but I found at that time, and I imagined as well that my children would be cocky and, you know, if, if they were born later and they wanted something and I said I couldn't afford it, they would say, what have you been doing with yourself? You didn't save for us. You didn't invest. So it also gave, and I, and I, I believe I'm a living example of the fact that when you give, especially not expecting back, there's always a reward somewhere along the line. I also found a way of having an inner peace. I invested in other people's children. I lived for other people's children. There was a day my husband actually said to me, he said, are you sure you want children? I said, why? He said, because the way you're taking all these children, you're not facing your own. I said, you know what? You fast, let me do this. So I don't develop ulcers like you. Let you do your own, let me do my own. Anyway, so if I hadn't been preparing then, and I'm sure many of you have heard about, if you don't fail, if you, don't, if you fail to prepare, then you're preparing to fail. So I believe that for me, using my time wisely then was a real preparation. The fifth one, taking stock and reflecting. How am I doing? A reality check. And this again, and maybe Mrs. Akers will talk about it maybe a little bit more later, is about entre entrepreneurship. When we're growing too fast, and we're not doing a reality check. It's like, you know, you find people come to the bank, they want to borrow money. And the business is, you know, they're selling and so on. Going back to what Mrs. Johnson, Dr. Johnson also said, and the person thinks that they're doing so well. And then they want a loan. And then the bank looks at the business and says, but you're making losses. Say, but I'm selling. You are selling, but you're making losses. So it's important that we sometimes step back on this journey to reflect. Um, so for me, for example, it was reconfirming years down the line that it was still an unexplained situation. So that we're not just thinking, oh, it's unexplained, it's going to happen. No. There's faith. There's foolishness. They don't mix together. So it's very, very important that even for those of us who are of certain faiths, that as we believe in that unseen thing as being real, we've got to also work towards it. And then seeking alternatives. And um, the, the, the last one is really finding purpose in the hurdle. I think that it's important because there are many times when um, we're not even, we don't know what our purpose is. We're seeking it in a way that may not actually get us there, but we position ourselves where the purpose finds us. And I think that for me, it really was about purpose finding me. Um, when I um, was working for a particular organization, we practiced the seven habits of highly effective people. I don't know how many people have heard of the eighth habit. And the eighth habit is about from effectiveness to greatness. It's about finding your voice and helping others find theirs. And again, I think for me, that was part of the um, uh, nourishment during my period of waiting. It was really about helping others find their voice and really truly finding my own purpose in life. Um, whilst I look forward to um, the, the, the questions, um, I think the summary of this really again is about choices. Choices when we find ourselves in unexpected situations, in un you know, with unexpected challenges. What choices do we make? How do we evaluate those choices? And it's very, very important that at the end of the day, we choose very wisely. Thank you. <laughs>